Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I've had a lot of people ask me to do a video on this subject, so we're going to get right to it. We're going to talk about the servo subs and how to work the controls on the amplifier to integrate it to any speaker. And there's so much flexibility built into this control system, it's probably one of the easiest subwoofers to integrate to anything. I mean, literally anything you got, you can dial these in to match the slope, to match the, the uh, output levels, the phase, everything is completely adjustable with this amp. So let's dive right in. First of all, servo control system. This is not the servo control systems of old. Uh, I know you've had, um, I've had people ask me or say to me, oh, Paul over there at PS Audio says they're not even using servo subs anymore. They're back to regular woofers, but they think that's better. And that may be better for them. Um, but this is not that type of servo system. They're talking about old accelerometer-based servo subs from the 1970s. This is a whole different technology. It's using a sensing coil that is much more accurate, much faster, and has a lot better control and literally will do anything you want it to do. I mean, you can change the damping settings, the cue of the whole system on the fly with this thing. It's awesome. So with that in mind, a little bit first, how does it work? What What is it doing? Well, the servo system works like this. It's constantly comparing the input signal to cone movement. So let's say it's receiving a 30 hertz note or a 25 hertz note. It knows that a certain amount of excursion is needed to maintain that. So in this case, the amplifier, due to the way that it's set up, will add gain as needed to maintain a linear response. And then once that signal stops, it says, okay, the input signal has stopped, therefore cone movement must also stop. So it electrically slams on the brakes and brings this thing to a stop really quick, uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, typically about seven times faster than an uncontrolled driver. So lots of control. You, you wind up hearing lots of detail and dynamics and things and texture of bass that you normally won't hear with uncontrolled drivers. Um, and then with the open baffle application, wow, that takes things to another level. This is the only servo controlled system out there for open baffles. So the open baffle tends to not load the room like a tip, typical woofer will. You're moving air quickly from one side of the room to the other and more of a velocity of the output rather than pressurization. So you don't get a boominess in the room that you would normally get with a lot of other woofers. You're just getting a quick movement of that output and then it dissipates real quickly. So it's a whole different ball game. Even in open baffle, those things will play flat to 20 hertz and they'll stop on a dime. So um, really unique um, system. Now, how to integrate it. And one of the number one problems we see when people are trying to integrate it to their speakers is they try to measure their system, measuring the whole system playing at the same time. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be measuring your left speaker and your right speaker at the same time and then trying to dial in your woofers to match that. What you're going to get is you're going to get um, cancellation patterns that's going on between your left speaker and your right speaker and how that's reflecting in the room. And you're going to have a response at the bottom that might be doing this when if you just look at a single speaker, maybe it's not. You want to you want to measure just your left speaker, and then the servo sub for that left speaker, or the the woofer for it, and then you want to measure the right speaker and just the woofer for that one, and then you measure each of them independently, and then measure the sum. And when you're measuring the sum, you're looking for it to to create that balanced response. And I'm going to walk you through the ways to do that. And there are ways you can do that without measuring it. There's ways you can listen by ear. When we go to shows. We don't set up a measuring system in the room and start taking measurements. There's certain songs that I know and I know really well and I've measured and tested using those songs and I know what it takes to make a flat response and I know what it sounds like. So we'll sit down and play some of those tracks 
and make adjustments pretty quickly to get a balanced response. And it's it's not hard to do that at all. Once you kind of have a reference for how you know it's supposed to sound, if there's something wrong, there's adjustments on this that allow you to fix it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is try to figure out the phase relationship. So your speakers, you'll want those pulled out in the room to where they sound the best in your room. So you want to position the speakers first. Get them to sound the best in regards to imaging, soundstage layering, three-dimensional field, and things like that. Uh, if you've got them too close to the wall, you're handicapping all of that. Get those things out into the room a little bit. Um, enjoy what your speakers can really bring to the table. And then you're going to want to do something similar with the woofers. You want to move the woofers around to where they work best in your room. If you've got a way to measure... Uh, take measurements of just the woofers playing by themselves. Just if you've got a pair of them, like we do here, we've got triples on either side of us here. You measure the left one independently of the right one and look at how it's interacting with the room and try to create a smooth response without having to use any of the controls to manipulate it. So let's say you've got a speaker that's um, 3 dB down at 60. So you're wanting to blend to that. Keep in mind, you're not wanting to cross this where the speaker's 3 dB down. If you're crossing where it's 3 dB down, you're going to create a 3 dB hump in the response. You want to cross the woofer over to the main speakers where each of them are 6 dB down. It's the same way when we design crossovers for different speakers. The tweeter is 6 dB down, the mid is 6 dB down, where they cross is the crossover point, and where they sum is the flat line. So you're looking for that 6 dB down point. So if your speakers are 3 dB down at 70, that 6 dB down point may be 50 hertz or something. So you're not going to want to set this at 60 or 70 hertz uh, to form that crossover point. Remember, the numbers on the dial referencing the crossover point on the amp are just numeric references to the slopes that are uh, built into the amplifier that are electrical slopes. It is not... It is not in reference to an acoustic output. Keep in mind that the acoustic output completely changes whenever you put it into a room. And it can change depending on whether it's sealed box or open baffle. A lot of times in open baffle applications, we've crossed at 180 hertz to some big open baffle line sources that have neotens in them that don't play down very low. And to cross at 180 hertz, we may have the dial set at 90 maybe 100 at the most to reach a 6 db down that's at that crossover point and it depends on the room gains too so don't think of this as these are my crossover points on the dial again electrical references you're going to have to listen or measure your room and see where the actual acoustic outputs are and most rooms will have some gains going on somewhere Either just, just the gains alone from overwhelming the room, it may be increasing the output, or there may be a hump in the room. Like when we used to go to Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, a lot of those rooms that were 13 feet by 19 feet typically had a hump at 50 hertz. You know, or somewhere in there, depending on their system, you go room to room to room and you hear bass boom, bass boom, bass boom, bass boom. And it was awful. It was really, it really was just awful. Um... So when you have this kind of flexibility, you can fix that. And if you've got a peak in your room, let's say at 50, then instead of running this up to where you think that crossover is, you can pull the crossover point further away to compensate for that hump. So there's a lot of flexibility going on here. So keep in mind, the numbers are just numeric references. That is not your crossover point. You're going to have to listen. You're going to have to measure. Step one. Uh, again, let's say your speakers are 3 dB down at, at 70. What you want to do is set this dial to where you know it's going to be above that. This is especially if you're listening. And set this dial to 70 so they're on top of each other. And then set the phase control, which is a time delay feature. Set your phase at zero and listen. Play some bass heavy music and listen. And then grab that phase control and spin it all the way around to 180 listen again. Decide which way has the greatest amount of output. Which one is the most bass heavy? That'll tell you 
which position on the phase control is most in phase. And usually you want to start with either 0 or 180, go between the two, and you'll know real quickly which one has a little more base than the other. If you're measuring it, it becomes a little easier. You can measure the output of your speaker, measure the output of the sub, and then sum it. And then try it with a phase in both directions. See where you're getting that gain. That's what you're looking for. Where is the, Where does the phase control need to be? And then, of course, if you need to, you can adjust it anywhere between 0 and 180, and you can fine-tune it and dial it in. If you've got a way to take measurements in your room, that's going to be really useful because you can really dial it into where it's in phase. So, and it's, it's a lot more useful than just a, a switch between 0 and 180. thing works really well. So we're going, to, we're going to want to find where it is in phase. And then you're going to want to move that crossover point back to where it sums flat. Again, if you can measure the speaker and then the woofer and then measure the sum, you can see what it's doing with each other and see where you get the flattest sum. And then if you've got a peak, let's say you've got a, you got a peak at 20 or 30 hertz. You've got a low frequency bump in the room. And some people like that. You may want to leave it that way. But what you can do is turn the overall level down and then turn the crossover point up to balance it out. You can do the same going the other direction. Let's say you've got a dipped area down low. Your 30 hertz in your room is dropping off a little bit. What you can do is bring that level up so that it's louder and then turn the crossover dial further back. Go back to 40 or 35 hertz and bring the top end down. You can shape the slope by using just the volume control and the crossover point, you can make it do just about anything you want. Once you kind of get it to where it's summed and it's flat with your speakers, uh, if you do have a peak or a dip, there's a one-band EQ that you can turn on that will allow you to make adjustments within a given area. You can, do, um, you can take a range where you, you maybe you have a peak that's like this, or maybe you have a broadband peak. You can adjust how broad or how narrow of an area you're wanting to adjust with the one band EQ. You can create a narrow band peak or dip, or you can create a wide band peak or dip. And usually one band is plenty. You're not going to have from 60 hertz and down, you're not going to have multiple peaks. You're not going to have a peak at 20 and a peak at 40. It doesn't work that way. Those wavelengths are too long. Usually you're going to have one big hump or one big dip, and you can you can work on that to fix it. So you can add a little bit of gain or you can take quite a bit out and try and fix one of those areas. Typically, though, with Open Baffle, we, we don't have a lot of that. Um, it loads the rim so evenly, we rarely get big peaks and dips. But if you do, um, it's easy to adjust. And, of course, these amps are available on our sealed version, so you can adjust it on that, um, on that version and do the same thing. You can change any peak or dip in the room, fix it, do anything with it. So... Once you've got a balanced response, um, there's a lot of other features that are on this amp. I'm going to put my reading glasses on here so I can look at it with you. And there is, uh, first of all, there's a, there's, a, there's a switch here that's an EXT12, which is a, when it's in the middle position, that means the crossover slope is 12 dB per octave roll-off, and it's completely controlled by that uh, crossover control knob. Or you can select it in the up or down position, and you can add another 12 dB per octave slope at either 50 hertz or 80 hertz. So you can help create a little more of a steeper slope by the manipulation of those two filters. Um, and you can do a lot with it. You can have this adjusted a little above it and then cut it, or you can have this adjusted a little below it and then cut it at that certain frequency. So you can really make it do a lot just with those two positions at reducing output more in the higher frequency range if you need it to be steeper to match the roll off of some speakers like a little some of our open baffle speakers sometimes they're pretty flat down to 50 hertz and then they drop off pretty quick it's just the way it loads the room so you can match the slopes with that real easily the other switch here is a rumble filter you can turn that on or off if you're playing vinyl you may have a lot of really low frequency information that's just fluttering the woofers just turn that rumble filter on and it'll start killing everything below 20. Um, then on, over here you have extension filters. You can determine how low you want the system to play. There's 14 hertz, 28 hertz, and 20 hertz. So you're basically just saying, hey, I want it to play 
this low, that low, or not as low. You can really adjust how low you want it to play. And you can also use that as an EQ system as well. If you've got a hump in your room at 20 hertz, well, you can cut that back to 28 hertz and try to balance out your room with it a little bit. The other control we've got over here is high, medium, and low damping settings. That has to do with how much control you're hitting that woofer with, how fast it is. And it's not necessarily the best sound on the highest damping settings. Sometimes even the lower damping settings will allow a little more low in extension, and it does a little to the sound stage. It, it can really change the size and the openness of the sound stage by changing those damping settings. I know that's kind of puzzling, but it does. We've even been at shows where we've had big open baffle servo subs up front, and we've got sealed box servo subs in the rear corners of the room, and they're set at 25 hertz and down. So they're playing part of the bottom octave back there, and we can adjust the damping settings on just the rear subwoofers and change the way the whole system is imaging. It's kind of eerie, but it really does do that. So listen to it. If you really want low, low-end extension, set it to 14 hertz. Uh, extension filter and set it to low damping. That's going to let those things go down to the rock bottom. Um, if you don't need them going that low, or if you're watching movies, you may want to use a higher damping setting or reduce how low you're letting them play. Don't let them play all the way down to 14 when you're watching movies. Uh, a lot of those movie soundtracks will really emphasize something down low, a big explosion. They're wanting to be that big wow factor. And just when you think you've got things balanced, all of a sudden a lot of subwoofers just completely bottom out. And that, that's just typical of a lot of those movies. So you, on movies, you may want to set it to, to 20 or 28 hertz to minimize just how much excursion the whole system's going to see uh, when you start playing those big um, explosions and stuff. Um, the other thing, you've got speaker level inputs and you've got RCA inputs here. You've got low level and high level. So you can come right off your amplifier into the speaker level inputs. It'll take a left and a right, and it'll sum those internally. So it, it works fine as a mono amp, or you can just do left only or right only. Same goes for the RCA input. You can do a left only or right only, or you can feed left and right into it, and it's going to sub them internally. Some of the amps also have a high level out. It's got, it'll show 80 hertz high pass filter, which you don't really know what the high pass filter is because it has to do with the input impedance of your amplifier that you're plugging it into. Uh, and what it's got is an electrolytic cap in the signal path. We don't recommend using those because then the signal to your entire amplifier on your main speakers is passing through a little electrolytic cap. There are better ways to do that. And I want to show that to you as well. If you've got, uh, let's say you've got some mini monitors and you've got a big amp on those things, which could easily bottom those things out. And you want to blend it to your subwoofers. What we do is we use little inline filters, and we make them. You can make them yourself, too. It's just an easy, simple RCA in, RCA out, and we put a high-quality capacitor inside. Uh, these have Sonicat Platinums in there. I think this one is um, this group here, or 047s. These over here are some 033s. And basically what you just do is you just plug that into the back of your amplifier, just like you plug it in there. Nice tight fit. You just plug it in, plug your RCA uh, cable into it, and it'll restrict the low frequency that's going to your speakers because it's restricting it to that amp. What that does also is relieving that um, bottom octave so that the amplifier never sees any of that low frequency signal can really increase the headroom of your amplifier. So that works great as well. Also, we usually put a little bypass on it. So you can see there's two RCA inputs. This one's actually the input. This is an output, and it just bypasses the capacitor so that it's just a loop through. So you can plug this into the back of your amplifier and plug an RCA cable here, unrestricted low frequency, and run it over your servo subs, and your preamp then is just plugged into this one here. So it's a Y, it's a splitter. One leg's filtered, one leg's not. Simple as that. It's easy to make these. I recommend some good quality connectors. Don't get anything cheesy. Um, these are happen to be some Cardis inputs, so they're they're decent inputs. And there's some really high end stuff out there you can use. And those cap values are not very big. You know, a 033 and 047, those are pretty small cap values. Use good quality caps. Use a good film and foil cap. Put a MyFlex copper foil cap in there. You can. 
it's it's not expensive because it's it's a small value. It's worth spending forty bucks on a cap or thirty bucks on a cap because the entire signal to your main speakers is going to pass through that capacitor. So you want it to be high quality. So that's the way to do it if you're rolling off the lows on your main pair of speakers. Also, if you got a, even a floor standing pair of speakers and they're boomy, there's just too much going on there. Put an inline filter in line with it and roll the bottom off. And then use your servo subs to pick that bottom up, and you can use the controls on the servo sub to balance out the response so that it's nice and flat. You know, it's it's great to be able to do that. I remember one of my colleagues at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest came to me and said, man, my room is so boomy. It, the, my big HT3s were just overwhelming the room. I, I, had to, I had to remove them and put my little song towers in there, which is another great speaker that he has. But it was a smaller speaker, and it didn't love the room. He said, what, what are you guys doing? And I said, I just turned the dials on the servo sub down to where they're balanced. <laughs> Real easy fix. If you've got adjustability and you've got control over the bottom ranges, then, uh, man, you've got it licked because uh, that's the tough part. A lot of guys are trying to use DSP systems to control all that stuff. Uh, they're trying to use mini DSP and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, Dirac, which is actually a pretty good one, to control that bottom end. And, and those can be effective, but sometimes you don't want all that in your signal path. Um, you can keep that stuff out of your signal path and just handle it on the analog output much easier and without degrading the signal. And something like this as an inline filter isn't going to degrade the signal to your main speakers. This is the way to, to filter that stuff off. Granted, it's a low order filter, but it works great. Uh, on my preamp, there's three outputs on my preamp, and one of them... Uh, two of them are full range. One of them is restricted a little bit. And again, this, the cap value that you need depends on the input impedance of your amp and the target 3 dB down point you're trying to hit. And keep in mind, if you're wanting to cross it at 50, then you need a cap that's going to be 3 dB down at 70 or 80. Remember, it's a gradual slope. And then use your subwoofer to balance it out. So I hope all that made sense. If you got questions, if there's something I missed that I should have covered, shoot me a message and we'll go over it and I'll try to answer all your questions. Hopefully that made things easier for you guys. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't and we'll see you guys in the next video.